All right, welcome everybody back to another Zoomcast of um, uh, Process and Practice. Uh, I have uh, the great honor to have Peter Wayne Lewis here today. Uh, he's originally from Kingston, Jamaica. He came with his parents to Sacramento, California in 1962 um, and uh, was a tenured professor of painting at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston for 25 years and served as uh, chairman of that department. He is now uh, splitting his time between the New York metro area and his studio in Beijing, China. And he is uh, currently the director of the Oasis Gallery in Beijing. We are so glad to have you here. Uh, thank you, Peter, for, uh, for honoring us with your presence today. That's great. Uh, Kurt Steinberg, thank you so much for the invitation to uh, share a few words. And as it as everything goes, yeah, I mean, I finally did retire after numerous years at MassArt mm -hmm. and formally finished teaching last December. And uh, I, funny thing, I did not know that this pandemic was coming, mm -hmm. but it was very fortuitous when I actually retired because I don't know how well I would have done teaching a studio class, you know, online. However, uh, since the pandemic started, I've been at my home in New Jersey which is in South Orange, about 15 minutes from New York, Manhattan. And I'm sitting in my office, my studio office. This is my home studio. And it's about maybe like a thousand square feet, which I've worked in on and off for like almost 30 years. So I've been commuting to Boston all those years I was teaching there, but I always had this home studio. And I do sort of like small scale things, but the majority of my work actually does happen in the studio in Beijing which I built in 2005, 2006, when I started you know, to visit China. And uh, so it's actually been quite interesting. I think one of the key things for artists is you have to be able to live with yourself. And this whole business of isolation, it's sort of part and parcel of being an artist. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot spend time with yourself, you know, trying to digest or unpack the things that are in your mind's eye, your imagination, you'll have a really lonely time as an artist. So in some ways, the pandemic is just sort of sharing uh, the kind of life that an artist generally lives with the ma mass population. So in some ways, I'm thinking about it, you know, that way. So for me being at home, uh, the only difference is I kind of miss, not kind of, I miss the studio in Beijing because mm -hmm. it's about 5,000 square feet and I have uh, a large body of work that I started about three years ago. And I've not been in that studio since August 15 of 2019. If the pandemic hadn't started, I would have been in the studio for the last like six months actually working. That was the master plan. But the higher forces had other ideas and gave us this other opportunity which which is called a pandemic, COVID-19. So I had to shift gears. So my, in terms of like practice, uh, I'm sort of in a holding pattern, but what it's actually doing is it's given me an opportunity to readdress some of the ideas that I had already started here mm -hmm. in New Jersey studio. So it's always shifting gears or finding a new riff, a new way of just sort of imagining, you know, rethinking and the whole idea you know, I'm really influenced and informed by music. And, you know, I think you, you probably know my father was a jazz musician. Yep. He was classically trained in the European tradition. Franz Liszt, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, uh, things like that. So I grew up listening to music and my father became a jazz musician. In jazz, it's always at the heart of it, sort of improvisation. And everything changes every night you can play the same piece of music each night or try to, but you're given the license to shift gears, to adjust, to make it new and to make it fresh. Mm -hmm. So things like that are always in my mind's eye as I'm engaged in my studio practice, which you, you never really know what's gonna come up. So I'm sort of like touching on many different times of, types of things right now, mm -hmm. but let me suggest something. The pandemic profoundly is forcing all of us as human beings to take a pause and really consider what our place actually is, you know, in this world. 
and or the idea that there are forces much greater than the human being. <laughs> Mother Nature, Gaia, the goddess, wherever your gods and goddesses are, if you're not using this moment as a way to reflect on your life, I think you're missing a big part about what's, what's going on. And uh, so in fact, I've never really been much of a poet. I read it. I write about my work at times, but I was really feeling compelled to write something about my thoughts about the pandemic, like this time, and I actually wrote a statement, if you don't mind, because I think it just really contextualized everything I'm doing in terms of pandemic, my processes, how I think, my practice, right now it's profoundly being impacted by or being informed by this time you know, that we're actually in. But I think this, this statement I wrote, it encapsulates, encapsulates a lot of what I'm actually all about as a painter, my belief system, and some of the reasons why I do the things I actually do. So if I can indulge you. Oh, absolutely. That yeah. would be great. So this is called uh, Thoughts on the 2020 Pandemic. I have always considered that we as a species are dwelling inside a body which surrounds us that we call nature. The space that surrounds us, our individual bodies that delineates our borders and shapes our appearances, enhance, enhance through our senses, create what we call reality. In the great Jan van Eyck painting of 1434, Arnolfi portrait, there are visual planes uh, creating the illusion of different realities through mirroring. Different realities inside of reflections, perhaps like what is postulated through the theoretical physics idea of strings. The Arnolfi portrait, it's the husband and wife. It's that Van Eyck painting, everyone knows it. The husband and wife are standing and there's a mirror like behind them. The dog is in the front. If, if you're up on your art history classes, it's a great painting. But inside the mirror behind the couple, there's a mirror and inside the mirror, there's a, another mirror. So the reflections and sides of reflections. String theory postulates that there are 10 dimensions that actually exist in the world. So the idea is that there are alternative realities, different ways of imagining what the world actually is. I didn't invent this, but I'm sort of inspired by these thoughts. Okay, so the Anolfi portrait, for me, has always been one of the great paintings of the world. It's quite stunning. Uh, there are visual planes creating the illusion uh, of different realities through mirroring. Uh, reflections, perhaps like what is postulated through string theory, creating what we consider to be matter in the shape of the world. Inside the human body, our internal organs. We have our brains, our heart, our liver, our stomach. There are biological parasites also that assist us in our digestion and keep our body healthy and maintain an ability to heal itself. The antibodies that fight off invasive viruses, <coughs> diseases, or mechanism of maintaining a semblance of like order. The internal organs of the cosmos are the planets, stars, light, gravity, space, wormholes, black holes, dark matter, the strong nuclear and weak nuclear force, and much more that's within the body of the cosmos. The human animal is a mere speck inside of the body cosmos, which at times is creating havoc, disrupting the balance of our immediate ecosystem through pollution, environmental disasters that's been happening, global warming, uh, ruptures in the atmosphere. If the human body heals itself by attacking invasive elements with good antibodies, then by inference, the body cosmos as a living entity by a different definition also attacks invasive elements, which the human population has the capacity to be, as well as engendering good enzymes by being in harmony with the surrounding fields of, of energy. So a lot of what I'm actually doing, there's still some more of this that's coming, but the idea of about what a painting actually is, mm -hmm. in the Renaissance, a painting was considered to be a reflection of what the world actually looks like. If we think about 
a mimetic pictorial structure. We're trying to make paintings of what we actually see and inventing a way of creating a kind of reality. We're trying to reflect the things that we're actually seeing. Uh, so there are many different ways of thinking about how we want to frame our sense of not just being, but what the world looks like to us. I mean, that's part of what the job of the artist actually is. The invention of the camera forever changed us because it gave us a different way of documenting, you know, what we consider to be reality with a, a device, you know, the ocular device of shaping things, framing things, you know, presenting things from a different perspective, okay? Let me go back and finish the statement. Uh, however, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to make changes to our society and culture as it seems quite appar apparent to us, the veil of beauty has once again been lifted. Seeing blue skies, there are members in India, like in Mumbai, other parts of India, they've never seen blue skies. So it's like the heavens and the skies opened up because all of the factories are closed down and generations, they've never seen the, the mountains or the skies ever clear in the whole lifetime. It's quite shocking. Uh, so for me, the veil of beauty, mother nature, Gaia, uh, we have an opportunity to readdress or to relook at what the world actually looks like mm -hmm. by the sublime, the beauty and the horror of what nature actually is. So I think we're really being given a really wonderful opportunity to readdress what the world looks like, what we see, what we think, where our place actually is. Uh, the animals are moving in seamless fashion as it should be once again. And the animals, the whales are going into rivers, the fishes, it's like, it's quite astonishing what's really mm -hmm. going on. We are animals also, we are the human animal. And it is also given us an opportunity to really consider, you know, who and what we are. Alan Good, you know, he's the physicist over at MIT. He's one of my great heroes. He's really quite amazing. And he's the one that's been at the forefront of uh, the expansion of what the cosmos is actually going through. Nothing is stable. Everything is really moving. It's expanding. And string theory is one of the things that he's been promoting. And I find it really quite fascinating. Uh, he has coined a phrase, the, it's the false vacuum. And the false vacuum is an idea that postulates that the trigger for the Big Bang was created out of a vacuum. And the trigger for the Big Bang is a false vacuum. I cannot paraphrase Alan Good. This mm -hmm. is his life work. Right. But he's teaching over at MIT mm -hmm. in New England. He's an amazing guy. And so I think about things like that. So the idea of triggering the Big Bang, you know, the false vacuum, this represents to me another reflection of another world inside a world of multiverse layers of realities inside other realities or a metaphor of the human body. Okay, that's a lot to kind of think about, but I think for us as humble human beings, we're always trying to document our sense of what the world looks like. And so physics is just an examination of trying to explain or give us other ways of like thinking, seeing, you know, like being. And the pandemic is profound. And we're living through a very, very important time. And to bear witness to the yin and the yang of what life is, life, also death. And it's really one thing. Life and death, it's, it's parallel. And we live and we die, and that's how the world actually is. And what we choose to do when we're alive in this world, we have a, a duty or an opportunity to hopefully effect change, to do something. I make pictures. I have pictures. I make paintings. And I'm trying to find a way of discussing, describing, you know, my sense of what I think this world actually is, and hopefully uh, add to or offer up good things to think about.
such as like beauty, relationships, uh, things of this sort. Uh, process. I'm in New Jersey. <laughs> And I'm, you know, I spoke about this a little bit earlier. I'm in my studio here, and my process has always been about certain kinds of ideas, which dovetail into that comment that I just wrote about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. In process, it's always about finding an idea. You have to know what you're about, or you're trying to figure out what you're actually about, and framing it through certain sets of like ideas, tropes, you know, things that inspire you. I talked about music before, I think philosophy, uh, dance, which is really one of the first things that we invented as human beings. And painting is a kind of a dance. It's a rhythm of the human body. Mm -hmm. It's how we move, how we think, the gesture, how we move with our brush, our pencils, whatever it is, and the movement of our bodies and how we engage the pictorial plane how we engage the canvas, how we engage uh, the opportunity of building a picture of, of some sort. So process for me, it's a kind of a dance because I'm moving back and forth to my canvas, my materials, my implements, and it's a rhythm. It's a rhythm of one's body, one's mind, how we think, and you know how we actually create. And the whole act of creation is a pretty daunting enterprise and uh and creation not to get too deep into my spiritual beliefs because but ultimately we're all spiritual beings no matter who your gods are or goddesses right and uh so process is a spiritual activity for me it's my body and my practice my process this pandemic for me, it's really all like one thing. It's really one thing. And we can try and parse out each of these different sorts of segments of you know, how we think, how we work, and how we make paintings, how we make music, how we organize a community. Uh, Kurt, you being the president of this wonderful institution in New England, it's not much different than what I do as a painter and you are keenly interested in the finer arts. I mean, that's why you're holding this position that you actually have, but how you engage with the population that you're in, it's also a dance. It's a dance of your mind, your intellect, your humanity, and how you choose to engage that body at Montserrat. It's a body of human beings, of people thinking and trying to make a difference you know, in this world and you have a daunting task. And so I have great respect for what you're doing or anyone in the position that you're in. And I caught myself lucky right now, I'm isolated. I mean, my wife is upstairs, I'm down in the studio, I'm doing my thing. And uh, which is a, it's another way of like thinking, but it's a way of like being. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Questions. I mean, I've thrown out a lot. There's a lot yeah. more that I could address, but no, I have, you have some things I could. Yeah, a couple of things I wanted to uh, make sure we covered for for people. I think are important, and I think um, a lot of what you said, which is a, a, a lot to cover, but the the I think the overarching idea that I take from that that I think is important, especially for our our student artists, I think to listen to is. Um, you know, you're you're talking about creating a whole sense of that 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 research, reading, informing yourself about the greater world, is seems to be a necessity, in my mind, and I think you were talking a little bit about that, in order to have really meaningful work at the end of the day, like how you as an artist interpret all of that information, is sort of the special creative aspect of what you bring to the world, right, and what you bring in, in, in as an interpreter of those things in a different way and almost making it accessible to a wider audience, right? Right, absolutely. But when you sit there and talk about string theory and talk about all these things, there's a group out there that'd be like, string theory, what does that have to do with, with painting? You know, what does that have to do with creating <laughs> things? And I think um, I struggle with people about that, right? Where they, they try to, in, a, in some ways, simplify 
what the cre- what what creative practice really is all about in process, right? right? And it's it's not simple. It's a lifelong journey, right? So, and it's this sense of discovery. I think in some ways it sounds like that sense of discovery. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's a motivator, right, for you to continue mm-hmm. to be doing these things. So, if you could reflect a little bit about, I think the necessity of an artist and a student artist, especially who's just starting out, sort of trying to make their way in engaging in subjects outside of the actual practice of the discipline, like the techniques of the discipline, in order to be able to really inform their work and make it meaningful and so and a journey, right, at the end of the day. Well, I think ultimately, uh, I think you raised some interesting points. And I'll just go back to the thing is, none of us really exist or create anything in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And we've all been built through all of our experiences and you know this conversation that we're having also i mean it's an experience and it's a virtual experience and when i was growing up as a young man in kingston jamaica the first object that i was giving to is a slate this is before your time kurt but it's a slate and basically you had chalk and you would write on your slate that's where you learned your abcs or or whatever and uh the slate is almost exactly the same size as an iPad. It's just an extension of it. Or for kids of the 60s, 70s, like an Etch-a-Sketch, this shape is very particular, okay? And in some ways, I think about the whole idea of how we communicate, how we reach people, and how we share, let's say, like, like information. Building blocks, uh, subject form content. Okay, so we can sit down and think about, you know, how do we conjure and how do we present, let's say, like our ideas and what is the most suitable form for us to, to present the ideas that we actually have. None of us exists outside of uh, our, our personal experiences and or the shape of what the world actually is. The subject matter that we choose to go after is really determined by our life experiences, okay? The forms that we choose to, you know, represent like these ideas, I think they're really, really key. None of us ex- exist in a vacuum, okay? Uh, the content, you know, not to kind of go back, but it's like the building block, subject, form, contact, how, how we choose to go after our particular kinds of like ideas, they're very particular. I grew up, sorry, I have to go back to this, in Kingston, Jamaica as as a young man. So I talk about like the slate, okay? Because the slate for me, the chalk, this low board, it's exactly the same shape as this computer screen that I'm talking to you through right now. Mm -hmm. We're mediating, we're talking about different ideas, but how we find a way of constructing our sense of reality, what the world actually is, and the things that we choose to discuss or describe or to paint is really based on a certain set of like ideas that we can't escape. And you know, how we share our information, it's very, very key. It's quite interesting. Okay, so uh, the fact that I'm sitting here looking at you, I believe you're real, Kurt, and I believe that because I met you many times in Boston, in New England. Right. Okay. And we've had many encounters, but not to get too esoteric, but I'm talking to you through a screen. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is an altered sense of what is actually real. Right. And in some ways, it's no different than picturing the world, except you're animated. Mm-hmm. Okay. A painting is another way of creating a sense of what is real we build a picture of the things that we find to be really important for us, and we locate our, our, our stories, our ideas, in this form, in this platform. Whether it's a slate, a slate with chalk, and you're building like an, a picture, an image, or this computer screen, and now we have students who are using the screen to mediate their ideas, to talk about certain sets of like ideas like tropes right and what you choose to be like your subject and ultimately what the form that you choose to you know represent these ideas through 
whether it's a slate, the computer screen, uh, it always gets back to certain kinds of ideas of, well, what the hell are you talking about? You know, what's really behind this activity that we're actually doing? And uh, so like framing our ideas and who our audience, you know, actually is, and some of the reasons for the things that we're actually doing are real key kinds of things, okay? The subject matter, subject that I'm going after is all located in this experience that we're actually having now. Not to get too, too esoteric, but I can't quite escape that. It's a very profound moment that we're actually in and at times, everything else seems sort of secondary. Mm -hmm. But maybe I'm, I'm staying in this sort of a philosophical point of, of view or way of like thinking. But for me, it's really kind of hard to kind of like escape that, right? So, uh, yeah. go ahead. No, I, I think, um, so taking it sort of more specifically for a second okay. and just talk a little bit about, um, because I think without addressing this during our conversation, it would, okay. it would be a loss. Okay. Um, if you if you don't mind reflecting a little bit, um, if you're able to, okay, or desire to, um, on sort of the what seems to be a, a broken record, right, of of social issues, right, okay. that keep cropping up over and over again and, and deliver, uh, it seems, with a little more intensity each time it, get, it gets recycled back, right? And just reflect, if you can reflect a little bit on um, for people to sort of maybe get your perspective a little bit if you're willing to offer it. And, and then also if, if any of um, sort of the upheaval that's going on, George Floyd's death, a uh, number of other things that have happened in, in a, you know, or, and continue to happen. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, George Floyd dying um, was a moment in time that unfortunately has repeated itself right. prior to his death and then since, right? Uh, there's, it's not like it just happened that day in Minneapolis, right? Um, we just, there's a group of people that noticed it, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, uh, and sort of it has fueled a certain sense of conversation and, and, and anger, uh, and righteous anger in a lot of ways, right? Um, but your, your, uh, your reflection a little bit, I guess, in, in general, not necessarily George Floyd in particular, but however you want to sort of frame it. And then if there's a way for us to, to has it made it into your work yet? Or have you even been able to process it enough to have it find its way? Or do you even see it finding its way there at some point? So if you, if, if you don't mind sort of, you know, playing with that uh, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, of course, all of these things, I'm keenly interested in all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, my personal journey, you know, thus far, being born in Kingston, Jamaica, uh, at the time under the British crown, uh, we were part of the Commonwealth until Jamaica gained their independence in 1962. So I am a person of the African European diaspora and my body happens to be located right now in South Orange, New Jersey, mm -hmm. you know, which is where I'm speaking to everyone from. But ultimately, you know, my experience of being considered at times the other, uh, mm -hmm. I'm an immigrant and a person of the African diaspora, you know, also, but by way of the Caribbean. Uh, I've lived in the United States since uh, 1962. That's when my family immigrated. And I think it's part of my, my story, which I think all of us, we all have our individual stories uh, through migration. I mean, even you, Kurt, some of your early ancestors came from different parts of the world, probably yep. Europe, Asia, whatever. So all human beings, we were all been engaged in migration. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the fact that, you know, my most direct uh, experience is coming in, 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 into the United States as an immigrant from Jamaica to Sacramento, California. And, you know, being someone that's experienced being the other, you know, through my ancestral imperative, you know, part of the African diaspora, the Caribbean, Europe also, Asia, 
And, you know, all of these things really impact me in a very important way. And so, in fact, the death and destruction of the African-American community, and uh, it's not a new thing. The only thing that's new about it is that we are documenting these particular events. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, thank God, you know, we have our cell phones now. And so it's really kind of hard to hide, you know, anymore. And so I think the idea that, you know, these events are like brand new, I think people of color, uh, people of the African diaspora has been catching hell since the first day. Mm -hmm. Okay. America is what, is it 300 years old or 400? I, I forget, right? <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're, we're young in world terms, but yeah. actually that's the other part, right? We're, yeah. we're old because, you know, we talk about how, you know, so-and-so discovered, well, if someone was living there before you, you didn't discover anything. That's right. So you have indigenous people that have lived here. So, you know, we're, yeah. we're as old as the planet. That's right. <laughs> the concept so, of the U.S. is over 200 years old. Yeah, yeah I think what's, what's really important, we're living in a very important age, and it's an age that we have the opportunity to document events. Yeah. So these events with George Floyd, the horrors, you know, of this affliction, you know, the affliction for me is the way that human beings treat each other. And for me personally, there really is only one human race. Call me a romantic. And, uh, but I am in, in some ways. There's one body, which is the human being. <clears throat> of course, you know, many different segments of the population has been disenfranchised, you know, over years through chattel, chattel slavery. I mean, I'm a product of that also by way of the Caribbean, you know, Europe, you know, things like that. And, you know, the African American experience in this country, it's quite profound. And, you know, I came out of the Caribbean, but I'm not exempt from, you know, racism, which is a really profound issue. And, you know, in fact, the problem is all human beings are at heart, they're, it's, it's tribalism. And there's certain groups of people that's always sort of, you know, unwilling to share imagination, you know, raw materials, but at the heart of it, there is a certain kind of survival instinct. However, I'm not gonna get too, too esoteric with this, but George Floyd, you know, the African-American experience, the death, the, the uh, destruction, uh, the people that's considered like the other, it's profound. I mean, it really affects me, it affects everyone. It affects everybody that's actually here. And the American culture, which I'm a part of, uh, it affects me, it affects, it affects like everyone that's actually here. The difference is we have the ability to document these events through mm -hmm. our cameras, our cell phones. And the people of the African diaspora, which I am a part of, have been catching hell since the beginning of time. And uh, so right now, profoundly, you know, people are beginning to see what's been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a kind of a great awakening that's really happening right now. My great wish is that profoundly we start to move towards a greater sense of humanity because every death, it should affect and it does affect all of us because it really is the human family and it, and it affects us really that way. Call me a romantic. You are my brother, okay? And, you know, I was raised as a Christian, and uh, we are our brother's keeper, okay? So every death that comes out of a, a tragic event, personally, it, 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 it actually affects me. And I really do hope as time goes by, we're going to come together in a much more profound way and... The idea that we're bearing witness to documenting, we can document these events now through the camera, through video in former times, picturing the world actually happened through making paintings, okay? But these are like static objects, drawing. And, uh, but right now it's profoundly important that we pay attention to what's really going on not to sidetrack too much, but 
the pandemic is forcing us to take a pause mm -hmm. and we're looking, we're seeing, and we're shut in, in our homes. And we're looking at what's going on on the outside and seeing some of these horrors that some human beings are doing to other human beings, but it affects all of us. I'm not gonna get too much into the politics of it, which is quite heavy, but it's a really important time that we're actually in. And classically, we documented these things through paintings, through drawing, but now we have the video and it hits us in a very profound way and it has to affect us, right? Uh, I kind of got off the track a bit, but what were what was the other thing you wanted me to speak no, about? No, I, I I think you covered it. I was about um, yeah. you know in ways of of how uh, this can sort of infiltrate your your work and get into your thing. I think the documentation comments I think make a lot of uh, sense mm -hmm. about that, and just you know just as a human being being able to express yourself through through your work uh, yeah. in order to to, to deal with these kinds of issues and then form others, right? I think is is sure. Thing. No, absolutely. You know, I think the the experience of people being considered like the other. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm an immigrant from Jamaica, and I became part of this culture in the United States beginning in 1962, and so I've had a very rich, very interesting life. You know, thus far, you know, in 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 the United States, there's a very interesting word. It's called stasis. And stasis, in some ways, it's part of what my paintings are about, is trying to find a kind of balance. Uh, formerly, like in painting, you really always want to have your paintings, the things that you actually do, come into some sort of like balance. And so balance in a way that one thinks, the culture that you're actually in, finding your place in it. And as an immigrant, this is a very profound issue for me is finding a balance culturally, formally, aesthetically. And that part and parcel is always like in my work and balance in the culture in terms of where your place actually is. And, you know, racism is a profound issue. It's not just here in the United States. It's just part of, you know, the human condition. It's, it's a global thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my great hope and wish is that as time goes by, we will transcend it. And I believe we actually are. I think the United States has moved greatly since, you know, the 1950s, you know, up to even now. But I think in some ways, that wonderful man we have in what I call the off White House, because I think the White House is a little bit off right now. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to get too much into the politics, or in Jamaica, we'd say the politics. So we have a trickster in the off White House. And we have a very important election that's coming up. All I can say is register to vote. I can't tell you who to vote for, but get engaged. Do not bury your head in the ground. But ultimately, uh, find in one place, you know, in the culture that you're actually in and trying to make a difference through the things that you actually do and uh, picture in the world from your particular particular vantage point, your perspective, mm -hmm. which is what I'm really trying to do mm -hmm. as a person of the African diaspora, of the Caribbean, and spending most of my life in the United States as an immigrant and as a citizen of this great country, which I am. And I vote religiously. And you have to be engaged. So we're living in a very, very important time and you have to be engaged. And, you know, not to make this too, too, too esoteric, but if you're not engaged, you're not living. And your work is always influenced and inspired by the things that we do. You cannot bury your head in the ground. When Pablo Picasso and George Brock in a different age was really addressing, you know, uh, the shifting of the culture you know, just formally, aesthetically, sorry, I'm, I'm getting off the track here, but even like Albert Einstein, general theory was really trying to reimagine, trying to discuss the shape of what the world actually looks like. Mm -hmm. And uh, science, the progress of like science, 
you know, these things were happening in a different age. All of these things are happening also like right now. And we have to be engaged. You cannot bury your head, you know, in the ground and expect that the world is going to continue as it has been. You know, it's changing. It's mutating. It's, it's shifting. And uh, the role and function of the artist is actually to be engaged. That's what Picasso was doing. Kurt, you're engaged as the president of your institution, and you set a standard of excellence. And hopefully you're, not hopefully, I know your community is progressing towards a, a much better way of like thinking, or not necessarily better, but a different way of being like engaged in addressing really important issues. Racism is an important issue. Picturing the world is a very important issue. Uh, George Floyd was very provocative to kind of bring it back because it was documented mm -hmm. through move, a moving picture. In former times, the painter, the artist, pictured the world, the horrors of the world, but it was a static picture, a static image. And it does affect us. But to see something animated and moving it seems much more real, but it's also a fiction, but it is a moving picture. It's a, just another way of like picturing the world. And <clears throat> just to kind of bring it back to this thing, uh, picturing the world is what we do. That's a function of the artist, is picturing the world and hopefully talking about things that are keenly important. And I think we're living in a very, very important age. And this time that we're in with this pandemic, and addressing our time is the main function of what the artist, you know, actually is. And if you're not addressing your time, uh, I think you're missing a large part of what is really going on. And uh, so in some ways, I'm trying to do that. And this time of being disenfranchised, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, I am still going outside. The politics of this age is very interesting. The pandemic is one thing. The infliction of the politics and the African-American community, the diaspora, it's very profound. But I think for me, the younger generation right now is, is involved. I was in my, my studio and I started hearing voices. There's a monumental march in South Orange, New Jersey uh, it could be thousands of people marching. I heard this roar and I went outside and there was a large protest for George Floyd that was going on. And, you know, Black Lives Matter, all lives matter, all human beings matter, no question. But there are segments of the, of the population that has been disenfranchised. And I think all of us, all of our duties as artists, as politicians as leaders of, of a community, which you are, Kurt, and formerly when I was teaching, uh, it's, it's part of our duty. It's part of the job description to try to impart or to suggest that there are different ways of like thinking, seeing, or being, or being engaged. Being engaged in what's really going on, and that's part of the function of what the artist is. That's our job. That's our job, is to try to reflect what the world looks like, and hopefully in a very honest way, or if you're going to be deceptive, know what you're, know what you're trying to do, or how you're trying to deceive your community. That's also a way of like thinking. That's okay. There's a lot of deception that's going on, but personally for me, I'm I'd like to be like a truth giver to the best of my abilities, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, you know the fluidity of like one's mind, one's thought. Uh, picturing the world, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a balance. It's a delicate balance. And uh, so I try to be truthful in a certain way and hopefully reach an audience of like-minded pe people and or uh, trying to set up a, a conversation, mm -hmm. a conversation, which I think is like key. I know I've touched on many different types of things, but I think disenfranchisement, the community that we're actually in, and the global community of human beings. Mm -hmm. We're engaged in something that's called art, whatever that is. I mean, I can define it in many different kinds of ways, but 
we're in go we're engaged in cultural production and the culture for me is not just montserrat god bless you guys or boston or new jersey or new york it's the paradigm it is the global culture of the human being. And uh, it's our job as artisans to make things hopefully that can give over a point of view that hopefully moves the culture forward in, in some ways. But all the things I'm talking about, the politics, disenfranchisement, racism, you know, all of these issues, it's all part of this culture that we're in, but it's, it's a global imperative that we as artists, it's part of our job. It's part of our duty to somehow try to make paintings that have paintings or whatever your objects are, but something that says something truthful about what your personal experience is, and hopefully your personal truth can resonate with certain kinds of ideas that perhaps can affect change in other human beings. And I think at the heart of what we do, I think that's, that's part of it. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have that be the last word and an awesome last word, sir. I really uh, appreciate your time with us uh, today. And um, I look forward to sharing this with our community. I uh, really want to thank you for the gift of your time, your experience, and your, your words and comments. I think, um, um, I hope everybody uh, really sort of takes the time to reflect on this conversation. You bring up an enormous amount of points and lots of treasures uh, and challenges uh, for the audience. And I really wanna say thank you for that you. and uh, have appreciated the time that uh, we've known each other a great deal. <laughs> and whether or not you know, or not, you've been a real teacher of mine, and it, both through my observation and our interactions, I always get an enormous amount of things to reflect on and to learn from. So again, I want to say thank you uh, very much for today. Oh, Kurt, let me, let me thank you also. Uh, my whole sense about being is I think we teach each other. And I'm, always, I'm always humble personally, you know, when I have an opportunity to share a few words. And I, I think ultimately, it's, it's what our humanity actually is. Mm -hmm. And I think you are a very special cat in terms of jazz vernacular, which I didn't even get into jazz yet. But jazz is really, my father was a jazz musician. I had learned a lot from him because he was a pianist. And ultimately, the world is designed by us and us being like engaged. It's a symphony of our mind, our thoughts, our ideas. Kurt, thank you so much. I miss you, my brother. Stay strong. Thank you, sir.